Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what are we on now? Episode four of season three of the Inspire series. And um, I tell you, what, I was playing this music in a uh, wee bit after the introductions. And just as a quick reminder, as always, please do post your questions. And um, if you want to post your questions, we'll definitely get them answered. Stick them in the uh, Q and A function because it's always easier. Um, to get through on to that. And I think with that, Kari, you're on mute, but if you want to unmute yourself and do the introductions, let's kick off. Thanks, Colin. Oh, Hi, everyone. I'm Kara Lang. There we go. I'm the EOH Group Head of Risk. And today I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to episode four of the Inspire series. Last week, we heard from Prof Shirley Zinn about do boards need a new purpose? And Prof Shirley reminded us that purpose is absolutely critical in all organizations, and especially amongst boards and leadership, they have to review, reflect, and relook at how and why they do business. So if you missed that episode, you can take a moment and go and watch it. Um, the full webinar recording is on the IOCO Tech website. Um, but for now, uh, stay tuned as Colin Isles is going to be speaking to author, journalist, and businesswoman, uh, Iman Rapetti, about using purpose to transform. Um, as Colin mentioned, you're welcome to post your questions and comments in the chat for our speaker. And also just a heads up, we do have three signed copies of Iman's book that will be able, um, that will be up for grabs today for three lucky uh, attendees that are joining in. So I'd like to hand over to Colin Isles of Innovation Catalyst who will help facilitate the discussion. Thank you very much, Cara. And uh, again, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, so who was the uh, the song uh, that I was playing there? If, um, if you can guess it out, uh, let me know. I'm going to tell you though, it was Lady Gaga. And I thought it'd be a good song to start with because I think she's absolutely awesome. She is the top of her field. Uh, I watched her when they um, had the president's uh, presentation, the ignoring, the ignore, I can't even say it, you know what I mean. It was absolutely phenomenal. Unlike my presenting, she's at the top of the field. And I thought it's a good song to play for you, man, because you're at the top of the field. I don't know what you've done to get there. I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. You're an author, and I've been reading some of your book. It's absolutely superb. Uh, radio presenter, journalist. You've spoken to heads of state, politicians, leaders, CEOs of business, and you've consulted to many of them as well. Welcome. Colin, thank you. I want to I want to almost approach this uh, webinar and this event in a Ramsian sort of way. This is Gordon Ramsay in and out of your face. <laughs> it's so wonderful um, to be with you today. And thank you so much to Cara and to you and to Sade for making it happen. Uh, and wow, there's so many people online. Um, so I'm looking forward to what they're going to say to us. So let, let's kick off then. Um... How did you get to the top of your field and just be so good? Were you just born good? <laughs> you are such a generous interviewer. I don't think I've ever really begun an interview with that as my opening question. I think had I done that, I would have fared much better. Um, I don't think I'm on the top of anything because I believe that our lives, you know, we, we, we spiral up or down depending on where we are in our journey of discoveries and consciousness. But Look, I haven't always succeeded at this, but I've always tried to do the very best that I could to be honest um, with people, to try and take myself and put myself out of the way a little bit, especially in journalism where that skill is required. And to really, you know, hold up that mirror and microphone to the communities that I was talking to and whose voices were already there. They just needed to be made louder. And I think it's that and also just being, um, everyone knows where I'm from. I mean, I can't suddenly pretend as if I had this private school education or be someone I wasn't. And they would call me out on that. So I think that part of just being real to where I come from, my blue collar background, uh, has in some ways made it easier for people to talk to me. And I think that's what's partly attributable or, you know, to my, my success. How did you actually get into it though? How did, how did you, I mean, when you were young and you were sort of late teens, did you imagine where you'd get to now? Um, I want to say 10 years later, um, but uh, we don't need to see whether it's 10 years or 20 years later. How was it? Did you see yourself in this position when you were approaching your you know, late teens, early 20s? And that's why I despise the where will you be in five years time question, Colin, because like if you ask people five years ago where they were going to be, they could never have factored in a pandemic, which has totally changed and disrupted our lives and our way of living as humanity. So as a child, I could never even begin to ask that because 
poverty in a way has a way of restricting how far you know you can dream we've seen people break out of poverty and do really well in their lives and they always did have a dream sometimes it's not so possible because you do feel defined by the psychological geographies the intergenerational geographies that you find yourself in um, but I think if you stick to the principles of being curious the principles of of hope and expectation and in almost a Tigger-like fashion, expect that the world is gonna open up and it's not just the hundred acre wood that you're living in, that things do happen. I am a strong believer in dreaming and defining a future that you could see yourself playing a role in. And then that the steps that need to unfold in order for you to accomplish that will unfold. And I think that is the biggest reason why I am where I am today. I don't want to, I don't want to term it success in, in the way that you have termed it, but I'm lucky to be able to have enough and to have enough currency to move in my life and in the world the way I want to. Mm. I was reading in your book and you had just one of the small chapters uh, where you talk about fear. Um, and you started off talking about fear of diseases, fear of accidents, fear of loss. Uh, but then you transition very quickly to the inward fear, your own fear of failure, of being exposed, unmasked, proved to be a to be a fake. And I think everyone, I think everyone has that. And especially as the higher up you go and the, the more responsibility you get, perhaps that fear encroaches even more. How do you manage that? Not very well sometimes, uh, if we're having a really honest conversation. But, you know, the pragmatism of my mother, who... You know, uh, um, there, there's a famous Mandela saying, which I can't for the life of me remember. It's got something to do with fear. It's famous, Google it, and it's definitely going to come up immediately. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's about our responses to that. We, we're all going to feel afraid of something and anxious about something in our lives at some point. But the analogy that I use with my children is, is it going to be a sort of backpack that you wear that's going to weigh you down? Or do you somehow put it under your feet to create, you know, a pathway for you to step over in safety to the other place that you're going to be where you can look at it with greater perspective and control. And that's what I've always done. It's not, thankfully, been debilitating and paralyzing that I couldn't pursue what I wanted to pursue. Mm. Now, you've interviewed lots and lots of really impressive people. Um, who are the most impressive that uh, you'd have? If you had to put a short list together of maybe three or four, who would be in that list? You know, you didn't prepare me that you're going to ask me for this hierarchy of preference because I would have had time to think about it because there have been so many people and people impress you for different reasons. So, um, you know, if let's I think... Narrow, let's narrow it then. I'm, I'm, I want to uh, look at the people that have impressed you because of their leadership. I know lots of impressed, you know, people have impressed you for lots of different reasons, but I'm specifically interested in moving towards talking about what makes great leaders, okay. what's corporate leaders you know should be doing what uh, parliamentary leaders should be doing and, and so so in that sort of narrow field um, who's really impressed you that you've talked to I think the answer might surprise you because yes I've interviewed captains of in industry I've interviewed CEOs on various panels and the one insider secret I must I must share with you and your audience uh, Colin is that everyone is trying to put their best foot forward and you kind of see people within a frame so because often our corporate in you know leaders of industry and captains of in uh, industry would be invited to talk about uh, leadership in a changing world, how to um, thrive in a VUCA environment. And, and so the frame is set for them. There's very wiggle, very little wiggle room for them to really reveal themselves to you. Um, but the most authentic examples of leadership that I have encountered are what happens to a family when they have lost everything and a mother is bearing her children. How does she bounce back from that experience? And how is that a lesson for all of us in context of crisis? You see your share price uh, plummeting. You see your children's trust funds dissipating. You see the stock markets crashing. Or you see the world suddenly become unintelligible to you, almost as if there's a new language that's been spoken and you didn't get the Rosetta Stone tutorial. So. Those simple, humble examples of how those women are able to bounce back and be resilient, rebuild, even go on to have other children that they can love, encounter and, and manage that pain in a way that becomes productive for them are lessons, I think, that both in the private sector and particularly in, in, in the corporate world in South Africa, we can learn a lot from. And to share that, those women cry openly. They, they share their pain with other people. And so we all feel like we are a part of that journey and that experience. 
But when it happens in the corporate sector, people disappear behind high walls or they disappear behind, you know, a number of different firewalls that they have in their organizations. That level of vulnerability, I think, even though you want to protect your, your share price, as we know, which is largely sentiment driven. So if you're weak, you know, the company might be perceived as weak. There is a there's a currency in that vulnerability that actually is an expression of strength. How do you do that? Because corporate environments typically create this lovely, soft, cushiony feeling as you go higher up the hierarchy. You're in your ivory tower, uh, limited in access, protected by your executive assistants and your chief of staff. You focus upwards, perhaps more to the board and the directs, and you're, you're well and truly cocooned from the rest of the organisation. So there's no real incentive for people to go and sort of show their emotional side show their own fears, as you put it, to, um, to be authentic with the organization. So I can see how it could be really powerful. And there are leaders there that do that, but they're quite rare. And why is that? I mean, look, I know that a lot of, um, you know, impressive, uh, you know, stories of reaching financial highs. And I think the obvious person that I'm thinking about is Jack Ma, who, you know, used to bicycle his way uh, around uh, where he lived in the village. And he was a teacher. And, and now he's this, you know, one of the, the richest men in the world effectively is I wonder if that exposure of, of, of those kinds of roots and the struggle to get where you are and arriving there is such a valuable commodity to you that in no way would you want to, would you want to compromise that. So you perpetuate, um, you know, this idea of, of, of strength and you, you, you kind of muscularize the lie that you've told yourself and we're speaking philosophically here. Um, but on the other hand, and, and there's an important point I want to make, which I hope doesn't disappear, is uh, disappear from my mind is, um, oh, it has actually, it, it, it's actually gone. But the bottom line is that people, I think, particularly those in within the corporate world are not immune um, there's no vaccination against failure and major corporations falling. And we've seen their mm -hmm. bones scattered in this economy of ours, you know, starting in the US with the 2008 financial scandal and on and on and on. I mean, even today, you've got massive uh, tax audit firms which are facing the brunt of reputational, massive reputational damage. So just because you're in the ivory tower and it's at the, you know, you've got the penthouse suite doesn't mean you're going to end up still in your ivory tower, but in the basement. What can uh, leaders uh, learn from that example that you gave, you know, where um, it could be the, uh, the mother of a family and they have some, you know, significant trauma, they have some loss and they have to go and, you know, graph their way and, and make a decision whether they're going to get back into life, get back on the bus or, or just collapse in a heap. How do, what can you bring into a corporate leadership team off that? Because I always think that the problem there on that transference is that corporate leadership teams don't feel the same pain. They don't have the same fear because they are so protected. And you've got that um, quote, how did we fail slowly then quickly? You know, and you, you sort of go along and everything's fine, fine, fine. And then suddenly, ah, but by then it's too late and, and the company's effectively gone bust or has been bought out. So you, you don't have that crisis in a lot of organizations to bring out those emotions and the perspective that you have in that analogy from you know, the mum and the family. Yeah, I mean, look, you can, fear is fear. You can put a different label on it. You know, you might have a fear of uh, failure. You might have the fear of exposure, but you are still experiencing some type, um, some type of fear. And what, what we notice a lot in our, in, particularly in this economy is what's termed the disconnect between the way corporations um, function, their connection to their people, but also their connection to the environment in which they live. And if you look at the criticism, for example, from human rights organizations around mining companies, mining houses, who years and years later have still not fulfilled their, um, their social and labor plans uh, and, and, and agreements with the local community, or they haven't put enough of a um, you know, a, a reflection of this wealth that they are that they are generating in the country into the communities that live right there. That's a sign of dysfunctionality. And so they have every right to be afraid because when that community says, uh, you know, we, we're feeling exploited and we have a very powerful and painful example of that in South Africa in the Marikana context. But there are examples like that that are replete throughout, whether it is mining, any of our sectors. 
you've got to stay connected with the, the what we would call like supply chain management. Like supply chain management could be the last cog in the wheel of how you make your, your product and send it to market. The, the, the human chain management is what needs to be managed by these companies is who's the last person on the track that is reliant on your company, that, that needs your company and needs you to behave in a certain way. And if you can connect you know, the, those two extremities and create a, a really beautiful, throbbing, organic arc out of that, you don't have any reason to be afraid because you're connected to the conversation. You know what's happening and you know what needs to be done and you can preempt those actions. You, when, you're, um, when you're advising people, you've got a, um, I guess, a simile where you talk about the head, the heart and the feet. Could you yeah. explain what that is? I, I thought it was a great framework. Yeah, and thanks to you for doing such great uh, pre-production work. There's a note that a lot of producers could take out of your, a leaf that they could take out of your book. Um, and it's in a similar way. I mean, if you heard uh, the finance minister yesterday talking about all these competing um, interests in our economy you've got to make sure that you know social grants are taken care of you've got to make sure that you don't overtax your population uh, and corporations you've got to make sure that you're not bailing out organizations that are already weighing like an albatross around our necks um, that to me is where is, is the kind of convergence that is needed in the way that business operates so um, you know if your organization has decided it feels a certain way about um, where their product sits in the market, how they're going to commercialize and scale, who are the likely winners and losers going to be. Um, that, that kind of, you know, sets that heart framework in motion, which in a sense works in connection with, with the head. It's going to set the vision for how all of the things that we feel need to be done in our business that has our brand DNA on it is going to manifest in this particular way. This is where we see it going. This is our strategy. This is our direction but it's got to be activated. And that's where even in South Africa, we fail because we always hear the adage over and over a repeated ad nauseum. We've got great policy. What we lack is in implementation. So that's the feed part is then move towards that um, with measurable goals, measurable outcomes that are elastic as well, that can weather the storm of, of change or when a direction needs to change that you're able to do that. So that's how those three elements come together quite eloquently. Yeah, but why don't people do that then? Because it seems relatively simple. You know, you, you've got to get the emotional context for people to buy into it. You've got to have some sort of analytics to it so that it makes sense. You've thought it through. And then you've got to go and get the team actioning and boots on the ground to go and, and do stuff. And yet that so rarely seems to happen, especially at, say, uh, let's call it a country level or a large organizational level. Yeah, you know what, sometimes I'm not convinced that we're as smart as we think we are, to be honest. I mean, some things, as you say, are just uh, the, the consequence of sensibility um, and just, you know, pra practicalities and, and, and being pragmatic. If we think of inequality in the world, and, and again, you know, we've just had the World Economic Forum. So obviously we trot out the same old figures again about how unequal the world is, how the 1% own half of everything that everyone else does. And in South Africa, it's 10%, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, that owns half of what everyone else owns. I mean, these things do not make sense. Um, you cannot live in a society that perpetuates inequality or inequity. Uh, and we see there's obvious opportunities for gains by letting more black women into the boardroom, by capacitating skills transfer, by investing wisely, by beefing up our school and education systems. We've just had metric results and congratulations to the class of 2020. But where are those results going to get you when we think of the millions of young people, 15 to 34, that are not able to find employment, as Stati they told us the other day. We know what to do, we just don't want to do it, Colin. So you mentioned, um, let's use that example, you mentioned black women. Um, we could talk about women in general. I think in South Africa at the moment, of all the listed companies, I think we have one CEO on the JSE. I don't think we have two, do we? I can't think of two, but we've certainly it's an absolute minority. What's preventing all of these women actually getting to the, the C-suite or actually to the CEO, the group CEO spot? Well, I mean, think of again, it's fundamentals. You know, we were doing um, a whole run of uh, a statistical review in August because uh, Women's Month, of course, is, you know, let's feminize Women's Month. I know it's important because we're commemorating a really important moment in South Africa's history, and that's the 1956 uh, past march. Um, but that sentiment can't only be for August, but we were looking at numbers and obvious things like just pay women what you would pay men for the same job. There's a 38% wage gap, for example. 
or um, invest more in women-owned businesses because your ROI is going to be better. That's what the World Bank tells us. I don't have the number in front of me now, but it's, you know, those statistics are there for us to see. And yet when something bad happens, who loses their jobs first? If you look at the first quarter of last year, and in those months where um, just after, probably second quarter, when we look at the impact of COVID-19 and unemployment on women, I think we lost 2.2 million jobs. I stand corrected on the numbers, but the majority of those were women. So we're lost in first out all the time. Again, when sensibility prevails, we are able to do the right thing and then we can adjust the imbalances that exist in our economy. But we're not, we don't have the will to do it. So can I, I want to bounce a theory off you then. And um, one, of the, one of the things that I've personally benefit, benefited from, and I think is quite fundamental to the success of anyone, is your network. I think if you can... If you're born into a network, you have an immediate advantage. If you're not, I mean, chatting to um, Professor Shirley Lynn last week and some of the other commentators, you can create a network with hard work and diligence and effort. You can actually go and build yourself a network if you want to go and do that on a social media platform. We've got lots of examples. I think networks are critical because if you get into the right network, you literally can go and be pulled along by the coattails of those who have been successful before you. And even if you're relatively average, OK, and I, and I think let's rephrase that. I think actually when we look at people, we're all kind of quite similar. The difference between good and, and not very good is actually negligible. Nine times out of ten, it strikes me, it comes down to how good you are managing the network and getting brought along with that. And so I suppose my question is, well, firstly, whether you agree with that, but I'll ask you to, to answer um, them collectively. If you do agree with that, is a principal reason that women aren't getting to those CEO positions because men are actually sitting there at the top currently. There is a preference in the networks that they create which favours men still to this date and therefore it's hard to break into when you get that disadvantage coming through to the minorities, minorities at the moment. It's, it's, it's that plus a lot of things. And again, if you go back uh, to those stats, on, uh, it is from the World Bank, on um, networks also being one of the um, sort of obstacle factors for women is that men have these old boy clubs, old boys clubs that they can tap into. You'll find someone, you know, opening a door for somebody else and on and on it goes. And it's restricted where women are concerned. And yet if we had that access, and access is a big word in South Africa. It's an important word in South Africa because you have, um, access has become privileged now. And I do find that if you have the correct network, you can increase your net worth. And by net worth, I'm talking about even just your, 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 the, the benefit to, to learning something new, to being mentored by someone, to being in those spaces where you can practice well, where you can practice having certain discussions and arguments. But if you are constantly left out, because we always think that net worth is going to be money, and it's not just about making money. There's a hollowness in my world, in my mind, that exists in our executive class um, in the country for, for many different reasons. You've attained success, but we haven't spent enough time building out on, on the inside that true and real sense of um, sort of gravitational stability that I can push back in a boardroom as a black woman, for example, um, and stand with authority and be listened to. And I can do it even if I don't have my friends around the table, uh, that I can do it on my, you know, on my own ability. But we don't, we haven't been doing that work of creating those support systems and those support structures for women who make it to the top specifically. And I'm sorry to take your question and make it only about women and black women specifically, but I think it's important. Um, and I, I just wish everyone who's listening, and let's see what the numbers are, 166 people uh, online with us on this platform now. How many people are you, especially if you are, if you are up there and you've made it as Colin, as, as Colin uh, has been saying, how many people are you taking with you along the journey? I've been lucky because I have a profile in the media. So if I phone someone, they already know who I am. They know that I am I'm a credible journalist. They trust me. And so they open the door. I've opened the door for others. So I don't, the trick is not to close the door after you open it. But let's start by opening that door in the network. Yeah, I think that's great. I don't know, Shada, if you can um, create that as a poll, if you can, let me know and, and we'll try to ask it. I think it's a great question. So what, so the network's are key. What can, if you're sitting there as a CEO and the leadership team in a large corporate, right, and you genuinely want to transform your organization, you're appreciative of the bias and you can see that you're still not getting that uh, results that you're wanting, especially at the senior levels. What, what advice have you got in terms of how they can start to go and open these networks for people to allow everyone to have equal opportunity to go and progress? 
it, to me, it's one word, it's oxygenation. The spaces are stale. They're closed, they're walled in and glassed in. Just um, a week and a half ago, I did a conversation for the African Union Development Agency and NEPAD. NEPAD, of course, is celebrating 20 years. And you'll never believe, again, when it go, goes back to the issue of simplicity and, and sensibility, is our businesses, 40% of them, I think is the stat, and, and, and again, please go and check as well and fact check that one, fail because of um, a failure in their business plans and a lack of uh, feasibility. And a lot of times the reason for that is that they just haven't had someone to guide them through the process. Somebody who knows how to do a bloody financial forecast, help an entrepreneur who's going to fail when they go to the DFIs because they haven't done a proper business plan. Yeah, sure, a lot of the DFIs will say, oh, we'll help you with the business plan. And I've been inside. It's not exactly what's written on paper. I, I promise you, you can get so entangled and then that's when you lose your opportunity uh, for that seat around the table. So the advice is, and even in organizations, do more of that skills transferring. Flatten, we talk about flattening the curve, flatten the hierarchy in your, in your building. You know, if you're a CEO, once or twice a week, have your office in the, business, in the office pool. Um, you know, spend some time with your employees. Don't only wait for a one-way channel of information that is going to filter a narrative that maybe you want to hear because they're afraid of you. Maybe you want to hear because you want the good news story about your business. Meantime, other things are happening because you just haven't cast your eye as widely or you don't have the right people in place who are your trusted scribes. Do you think that this will actually make a difference if CEOs were to do that? And by difference, I mean, this would add to the bottom line. Is diversity really a factor? Is diversity a factor? Is it going to add to the bottom line? If you can get diversity, is it well proven that you're going to have significant benefits? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, again, I don't have the chapter and verse on numbers and I don't even think you need it. Just again, you know, on, on a, from a sensibility point of view, the more conflicting ideas you have, the more agitation you have in the water, the more something amazing is going to throw up. If you're wondering why you're doing the same thing and it's really vanilla for you, it's kind of safe, but you're not going to shoot the lights out with your fourth, you know, fourth, quarter, fourth, fourth quarter numbers or, you know, or, or whatever it is that you're, you're aiming for expansion wise or however you're going to commercialize. Go back to where your brains trust and your heart trust in, in the building are. What are they telling you? And is it made up of enough people who are unlike you? You should have as many people who are unlike you as possible in your business. Uh, obviously, they have to be qualified. They have to bring something credible to the table and they be, have to be able to back up their arguments and their premise. But bring in more and more voices because like we see just in our country, even, I mean, if you read Richard Dawkins, just from a genetic perspective, you know, diversity and um, the strength of the species depends on us bring, being even more and more sort of mixed up, if you will. Uh, I, I ask that question deliberately because a lot of leaders don't seem to get it because I love that term, oxygenation, right? So as a leader, I think your principal goal really is to inspire your people. I don't know if lead is the right word. You're one person. You can't do anything for your organization just as one person. The whole goal is to empower and inspire the teams around you, the thousands of people in that company to do these amazing things. And yet the conflict is they're sitting in board meeting after executive committee meeting after project oversight sponsorship meeting and their diary is suddenly full, full, full. And they seem to therefore have limited time to go and do this oxygenation that you were actually suggesting and moving around, getting on the floor and talking to people. How, how do you get them to move? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm hoping that by actually just presenting simple arguments like this about the benefit they get is, is a step in the right direction, the head part maybe. Tell them how much money they're going to lose. <laughs> But they, but they don't seem to get it because it's quite ethereal. And I'm wondering if you've got sort of ideas about how you make it tangible so that they can actually go out and say, yes, this is the most important thing I'm going to have to do for three or four hours, day in, day out, forever. You know, before um, organizations become these multi-story empires uh, with listings on global stock exchanges and whatever, it started somewhere with an idea that did take flight. It started somewhere with its idea that was embedded in something, something good. And it's a return to those principles that first allowed your company to make those exponential gains in the early years, could be in the first decade. If you can see that some of those attributes are missing from your operation where you are right now, as big and as, you know, um, uh, and, and probably sort of multi-bureau, multi-country, sort of multinational how a multinational has become, go back to the primary things. It's like in an arrangement or in a, in a marriage or relationship. 
you know, you, you become stale. So you go back to, hey, remember, I still love when you just like give me flowers or something. And look, not, not to oversimplify what the direction that big organizations need to go, but sometimes it is a return to basics and the very thing that got you started in the first place. Is there a structural issue here? Because this type of conversation, I don't think sits particularly strongly in the, uh, the MBA schooling. They'll learn a lot about valuing companies and SWOT analysis and four to five forces and scenario planning and a whole heap of other things which are basically around the head and the financial side of things. But module 326, which will be for half an hour, probably six months in, might mention the power of diversity and how to go and inspire your teams. Do we have a structural issue here that's sort of bringing the wrong sort of leaders in? And, and this is the thing, you know, because my mom likes to say, oh, my child, you've done so well. But my mom got me where I am today on not even having a, a real high school education, uh, Colin. So, in, and, and, and I mean, you have idiotic things, uh, like what we heard the one minister say the other day about educated men don't rape, for example. I mean, so, so, so again, it's, it's not about PhDs and MBAs and, and all of those things. It is about a return to simplicity and plain old common sense of what you can be doing and what you should be doing in your businesses to make sure uh, that it flourishes. And you know, if, if, if it doesn't, you've got to ask yourself those big questions. Am I the one that is standing in the way? You know, um, I often have conversations with people either in my own team or people just in general. And, and I always invite a challenge to my own dogma. Tell me something that, that you disagree with about what I've said um, and, and, and let's debate it. What's, what happens in these networks often because of golf days and, you know, you kind of, you engrave yourself a little circle of existence as an executive somewhere because, you know, you, God forbid you, and I'm not saying this about all and, and don't, uh, don't, don't impute that at all, uh, that I'm saying this about all C-suite executives. I'm just saying, you know, if you're, if you're staying in the same place, hearing the same music and the same echo, are you any surprised? Are you, I mean, are you surprised that that's all you can hum along to? You've got to be placed in other contexts where you're hearing something different and that enriches your perspective. It may convince you of your initial position, but your initial position then becomes strengthened or it can challenge you and you can change your mind. I think I've answered your question. I know I've perambulated a little bit. Yeah, but I think it's a difficult question to, to answer in all honesty. I don't think, uh, um, as I said before, I don't think the amount of time they put into it on an MBA is necessarily enough, unfortunately. Sign us up. I'll do a course. I'll do a module for your MBA as a non-MBA student, by the way. <laughs> We're already um, setting up a course, which I think is quite interesting to try to give that support network specifically for black women. Can you just talk about that? Yes. Yeah, so I've been working for a few months now on creating a program that is specifically tailored to black women executives. Uh, we'll probably in, you know, include men at a later stage, but we see in our own analysis that the need is for, for black women executives at the beginning. You see far too many women who have worked so hard. And, and we know that for a black woman executive in the main in South Africa to make it into a position of authority and power, and I can only think of African Bank and Busani Ngawe, um, um, not, not Busani, I'm, 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 I'm the wrong person, um, uh, Basani Maluleke. Um, you think what happens in those spaces? And I remember interviewing her actually in August where one of the issues she was referencing was around what happens at sort of board level. And so we've designed, that, that's just one anecdote and, and you can follow the story for yourself. But what we have to do is retrofit black women executives for the things that they weren't taught, like you were saying in business schools. And, the, and some of these women are so amazingly articulate and accomplished, but it's the hard work. It's the stuff that resets the compass, uh, compass on the inside into that authority and, and, and gravitas that they can take with them along the ranks into the board, how to push back in a way that you know, that preserves your authority, uh, but also establishes real boundaries with the team that you're working in, who might think, oh, we can tell you because you're a black woman and you don't know enough, or we've been here for years and years. It's not the same way they treat white male executives, uh, I might add. And this is what I'm hearing from a lot of black women that, that I talk to. So the program is essentially not only our front facing, which is how you approach the media, how to message package, but it's also about how do I reclaim my own authority? What are the things that have happened in my developmental journey and in my career journey, my career path that I need to address? Where are those wounds and how can I effectively heal them? Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna thanks for that. And I, I wanted you to talk about that because um, I think it's a, a very well needed course and whether or not people sign up to your particular one or try to mimic it, it sounds 
Sounds, well, I've never heard of it before, in all honesty, so I'm fascinated about that. But I want to launch the poll. Um, thanks for setting that one up. I've just done the poll. It'll be interesting to see as that one comes in. While, while we wait for the answers on that, so we've mentioned curiosity and hope and expectation to be authentic. What other attributes have you picked up from your uh, meetings with famous and, and well-renowned leaders um, that you know need to get thrown into that sort of pot? These are the sort of must-haves um, if you're going to be good and strong and do the right thing. Focus and fun. So I did a really brilliant thing for a, you know, a multinational telecoms uh, company and they had a really great speaker who was uh, talking about just again, again, balance, balance. So you've got to be focused in the work that you're doing because you carry not only your own fortunes, but those of your employees and your community and society in your hands. Uh, and everybody helps in this economy as we're chasing 3.3%. Um, but also, so, so, with, so you have to be laser focused, but you also have to remember that you're a person. And it's amazing the impact of that fun factor in our psyches and how it you know, it radiates to our team that we're working with, coming into the office uh, every morning, um, you know, with the sense of, of curiosity, of youthfulness, of room for even for your employees to play. Now, I know some companies may have gone too far. I mean, you know, some might say having sleeping pods at work and, uh, you know, all of these other new age and, you know, neo ways of doing business is going over the top. But before you come to the office, you bring yourself, right, Colin? I don't know what you did this morning to have fun, but I jumped on my trampoline for a little bit this morning and felt a little bit better. I didn't do that. <laughs> and you have kids. You have, you have kids similar, similar in age to my kids. Is The reason I think they're so happy and your brood is happy and mine is happy, because we take them jumping. Think about how much energy they expend and they have so much fun and they fall down. When was the last time you jumped on anything? When was the last time you fell or climbed a tree or whatever? Go back to those things and you'll be amazed how much it shifts you in your organization. Yeah, okay. Well, trampoline is in the foyer. That's one thing that we can look at with the ambulance right next door. The, but I do, I do agree. I mean, fun. I always think that the structural setup of a lot of organizations just eradicates fun. It's clean lines and it's... Uh, very much a kind of a, a presence that we're creating with the company and you're the sort of minnow of an employee and a customer. It's almost set up mentally that you walk in not to be fun, unfortunately, in the way that office blocks have been built for the last decades. But look, there's also a legitimate, there's a legitimate anxiety, Colin. And, you know, for so many families, depending on where you are in your corporate structure, you know, am I going to keep this job? We live in such a recessionary climate. Uh, so many people have been retrenched, you know. I'd rather just conform, comply, stay in line so that I can hold on to my job, uh, not be too noticed. And we have to change that because we're, we're dealing with human beings and we're dealing with people. So what are the opportunities, especially in this lockdown environment, of being able to reinstall that with our workers and make people feel good when they come to work? You'll be surprised. As journalists, we think that we fight for the rights of other people, which is a kind of weird thing. But that's the, you know, the, the, the overriding adage. And we're very bad at fighting for our own rights. I cannot tell you how many toxic environments I've worked in with female bosses who have bullied me. And I think that I'm quite a strong character, but I'm also, ex I default to extreme diplomacy. And in those settings, I haven't stood up for myself and I've regretted it to this day. And you know, like when you're like, mm, I should have said that, I should have said that. And it didn't ever happen. It happens in many organizations. Um, don't do that to your people. It's horrible. Yeah. I've just, got, I've just released the poll result there, by the way. Um, and I think it's a shame it's anonymous, really, and we can't see the names. 84% of people say, yeah, they have impacted and uplifted and effectively networked others. And I wish we had all the names there so we could give them all the bells and publish that. Because I'm absolutely certain that if we were to do that on a larger scale with uh, an anonymous poll in a lot of other corporates, that we would not get anything like that um, as a response. I really wish we could go to name that. I want a slight uh, pivot here. Um, the one thing that we haven't mentioned, and I, and I suppose we should because it's in the series title, is purpose. How important is purpose um, to go and found and drive good leadership? Well, it connects us to the thing we want to do. Uh, you know, um, if, 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 if your body tells you you need the bathroom, our purpose is to go and, and do the thing our body's telling us to do immediately. Otherwise, bad things will happen. Um, and so it is an undeniable compass that we need uh, in, our, in, in our businesses. The differences in this context is what is purpose to you? Is it personal purpose? Is it, you know, is it profit purpose? Is it, you know, in, 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 in the business? 
I think that there's worth in excavating that term a little bit more because I think it's a little more layered than what we describe as purposeful leadership because you're caricaturizing a person or you're not allowing them to have any dimensionality in how they lead. It has to be multi-layered and if anything COVID has told us, it is also about having a purpose around self-care, is taking the time to look after yourself. I mean, I got COVID, I was very, very sick. Um, and I was like, what is all, that's when the questions come, what is all this for? Um, and in a similar way, you know, if you don't connect to that because we think it's so parochial and we think, oh, like that's the last thing, who cares? But take care of yourself and be purposeful in that. Your organization will follow because that sense of self-care and purpose in your, in your life, in your personal life, will flow over into what you do at the office. Because if you're having a good time and looking after yourself, you can't abide seeing an employee of yours suffering clearly, you will intervene. It's to also have, again, human resources, uh, organ, um, um, the human resources floor sometimes, and I mean it figuratively, is disconnected from the rest of the organization. How good are your human resources people at really being able to take an authentic pulse of your people and your organization? All of these things feed into how well you can assess where you're at and how capacitated you are to get where you're going. Because you can have purpose, but if you haven't prepared, you're not going to have the profit. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you said about that annoyance view or that deeper explanation of purpose. I mean, uh, we're seeing lots of organisations now that are really setting a purpose beyond profit. They're setting metrics around, you know, driving for actually focusing, I suppose, on doing nothing more than solving the end client's problem. <laughs> Imagine that, focusing on solving the end client's problem as a strategy idea. But then it seems to be missing in a lot of companies because they focus on the bottom line and they think by asking for an increased margin of 10% and getting their staff to focus on that, somehow they magically come up with this awesome customer journey. Am, am I being a bit unfair and, and sort of, you know, there or is this a movement we do need to see and it can be successful for organizations? You would know better than I because you're in this conversation with them and a lot closer to them than I have been over time. Um, yeah, you're not interviewing me, I'm interviewing you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so interested though it, and, and, and I take it and I'm just going to step away from the controls as well uh, Colin because I'm looking at the chat and um, it's so interesting just some of the comments uh, that are coming through on these basic things and you know you and I defined a theme for this conversation uh, on the weekend but if I reflect on what's happening now it's the similar theme it's about simplicity and sensibility yeah. That's what's interesting. And I like that we're in that atmosphere right now. These are common, these are these are just common courtesies and nice things to do. You don't need somebody with an MBA to tell you that. I just told you that and I don't have an MBA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I've got actually um, to answer, ask some of the questions. I'm glad you reminded me that people are posting stuff. So um, is the biggest threat ego or I think, um, how, how do I word that? Is the biggest threat a lack of trust at uh, the senior leadership? Or is it ego that they hold, the sort of ivory towers that create that to prevent them from, from doing the things that we've been exploring, being open and transparent and naked and interested and so on? Here's the thing. It takes pretty big kahunas to make a big decision. And I don't think everyone's cut out for it, Colin, to be honest. And so there is a value that you have as the captain of a ship, as somebody who's steering the organization. And maybe you do then need to have you know, a little bit of, of that ego and, 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 and self-belief, but there's a difference, you know, and we always say there's a difference between ego and or arrogance and self-confidence, but there is that special something that you have to have, and I think maybe that's worth the whole TED talk on its own, about that special source the leader has to have who's ultimately responsible for the big decisions, direction setting, and taking the fall if everything goes to bleep, bleep, bleep. Um, and, and not everyone is cut out for that. I mean, we see it in society, right? There are people who follow and there are people who lead. And I think that's part of our evolutionary biological heritage and that's okay. But when you have the special source, are you drowning everyone in it? Or are mm. you allowing them to just have a little taste every now and then and, and, and to find their own secret and special source? Maybe I'm oversimplifying a lot of these different things and I don't mean to be glib about how I'm, I'm, I'm handling this conversation. But I'm just saying that there is a recognition for that and it can be used in the right way. I don't know if you are simplifying it and, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, I suppose something that's always bothered me is the way that CEOs always seem to outsource and delegate to HR to go and sort out the culture of the organisation. Have you got any views on that? 
<laughs> um, I'm giggling slightly because I have been invited to a few places, which I can't name, um, to do that sort of work. And the people who come in sometimes remind me of, I don't know, people who, I feel like they've been harangued in a sense. Some are really excited to be there because obviously this is this might have been something that they've wanted or a platform that they've wanted to share, uh, not realizing it's not a platform to complain about HR. <laughs> um, <laughs> but really to understand organizational culture a little bit deeper and for the organization to understand itself. But I feel that the work can be, we're moving into a different phase. You know, we're 26 years into our democracy and companies embarked on this sometimes seemingly, you know, pulled by the nose to have to do this exercise and allocate money towards it. But if we do it in a better way, by rewarding talent rather than having symposiums, and, and you could do that by employing consultants like you and I uh, to come and guide that process. But the best way that you can secure, applaud and support diversity in your organization, A, bring it in, um, that's how you change organizational, you change both organizational and company culture um, and reward the people around the table for, for bringing in good ideas and for, for adding, for showing, you know, for re rewarding what the benefit of that diversity and that cultural change is. I mean, I, a couple of years ago, I listened to Astro Teller, um, who's the CEO for the X company, formerly Google X, the guys that make those driverless cars, or at least started this, this movement, amongst other things. And he said, he sees himself as his principal role, not to lead, not to go and dictate. His principal role is actually should be retitled as chief culture officer. And therefore his focus is every single day trying to go and help people to create an environment for them to just do these incredible, amazing things. Would you, you know, agree to that? And that, and that goes back to that question that I had. I always feel there's a bit of a, a get out when you go and delegate culture to a department because Surely it starts at the top, but you've got to lead from the front to go and drive that culture. You can't delegate it to someone else. <laughs> I've got such a negative association to the word department. It reminds me of like the, the constant theme that runs throughout George Orwell's. I mean, it's very Orwellian in that 1984 kind of That's setting. It. You know, the department of like, you know, the way you think and the way you move and where you shall go and things like that. Um, we need to decompartmentalize all of that. And as I say, you know, during COVID, we had a term, you know, flatten the curve. We should flatten the hierarchies. Um, some of the best run businesses, obviously, are, are those that, that have that sense, that real, the real sense that we are, we've got each other's backs. Thank you so much for bringing us to where we are and you've made us what we are. And so this is how we want to reward you. I mean, for example, in a, in a commercial venture that I'm hoping to embark on really soon is the commercial structure is ownership of those um, factories in communities by the community members themselves with proper canteens and healthcare facilities um, so that people, that's how you buy loyalty. I mean, you can give people a bonus. Yeah, great. Other people in the organization are going to resent you for doing that because they feel responsible for your success. But just recalibrate the entire way that the system works. And it's just obvious that the, the yield is going to be so much higher. Another great question here, um, because you mentioned it before about the fact that you don't have an MBA and uh, here we are listening to you and, and listening intently because what you're saying makes a huge amount of sense. And um, what does it say? I've worked with many that do not have multiple degrees, but equally, if not more practical and have more talent providing uh, better results. It's basically the inference that if you don't have those tick in the box certificates, you don't go up the hierarchy in the organizations. We're not focused enough on genuine skill and ability. We're more interested in the Okay, how do we go and change that so that, you know, actually we're employing people because of their skill and their grit and their interest and their curiosity, and we're less worried about these uh, pieces of paper they carry around. I actually want to find uh, the name of that person because that is absolutely, absolutely spot on. And again, it's no disrespect to people who've done the hard work because I can't tell you, oh, how I enjoy listening to really intelligent people who are intellectual and have so much content just you know they make so much sense in my world they they make the world so much more understandable and there's such a joy attached to that decoding the complexity so we need those guys with their degrees and so on but should it be a prerequisite in an organization and should we be looking at capacity capability and the opportunity for this person actually to be reskilled or upskilled in the organization Please, please, if there are any HR people on this call, take that cue. It is valuable. 
I have gotten, you know, where I am. I have um, a diploma in something and a half finished uh, diploma in something else. I attempted to go do my RPL at WITS and that didn't work out too well at the beginning of COVID. So I had to abandon ship because I had other, you know, other things to do. And I think I'm pretty sensible and okay. I do have a lot to learn and I'm, and I'm really grateful to do that. But I think that I benefit an organization that I'm in and, and, and here I am running my own company. HR, please give them a chance. When you do your skills auditing or um, uh, determination and those psychometric tests, whatever, whatever else you do, all the mysterious stuff that happens when, once the office door is closed, let's revolutionize that and change that and, and give people real opportunities for probation Let's see what they bring to the table. Give them problem solving things, something that your organization is facing and see what they would bring to the table. Give them a chance. Do you think we still need to employ people that have got degrees, especially with A, online learning, and B, we're already seeing in certain industries examples where they're uh, putting their work out there and, and they're kind of almost their character into online platforms. If you're encoding, you might be in GitHub and be um, picked up by a Microsoft or a Google. A degree is starting to become a little bit irrelevant for at least some coursework. So I think if it's a medic, I prefer the degree. <laughs> but going into business, which isn't really um, that same thing, it's a lot more abstract, I suppose, about how to go and run a business. Do we need these degrees? It's a tough one um, because you use the example I was about to use. I, I don't want no qualified neurosurgeon anywhere near my scalp uh, with a scalpel. So, so yes. And we, but on the other hand, we've seen people with highly, you know, highly qualified people order trains that are too tall for South Africa. So, you know, I, I think it really is um, a, a, a context where we, what is fit for purpose in this moment and who is fit for purpose in, 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 in this moment. That's it. When we talk about skills matching, don't let some robot decide based on an algorithm and how many answers they got on the test, right? Make that determination because um, in some areas, yes, as you say, in civil engineering and architecture, um, maybe in those fields, we absolutely have to have the benefit of that book knowledge. Um, but I think, and I'm not saying that in businesses you don't, because again, I've, I've seen, I have friends who have the MBAs. And when we have conversations, I think, damn, I wish I could get my MBA. So it's a very fluid thing. And I think we've got to be careful. And, and that's the thing is we live in a society right now, which is all about choosing the extremities. Are you in or are you out? No, I'm in the middle. Uh, can I just be in the middle? Thank you. Um, are you black or are you white? Uh, no, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not quite sure. Sometimes I'm on the left and sometimes I'm on the right. Let's allow that, but let's also reframe how we, how we find people for, for, for certain roles. You, you mentioned a while back about flattening the network and this all comes as part of, you know, you want to build trust amongst each other and, and sorry, flattening the hierarchy and, and building these networks. Uh, you've got uh, new management ideas like holacracy, where you're forming circles to go and pursue certain aspects which can unform and form naturally within the organisation. These all sound really great for startups or for large companies which have still got that founder startup led mentality. Have you ever seen a larger organisation? start to do that conversion from hierarchical and traditional to actually flatter and I suppose more um, more nimble in the way that they're approaching work. Um, probably people in our audience, uh, you know, know would, would be able to bring up some of those anecdotes in the contemporary sense a lot more, a, a lot easier. Um, you know, I'm thinking in the yeah, early well, days. I can, help, I can help out. I've never seen one or very few. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I suppose really the question is, it goes back to what you said at the start, because one of the major problems with it, doing it, it is that when you as a leader look to flatten the hierarchy, you divest yourself of control. And the problem is that that is a bit of an emotional roller coaster because the thing that got you there was control and hierarchy and the ability to go and you know ask people to do things. And now suddenly it's a lot flatter, and so you've got to be a lot more collegiate. And they might not do these things, and your power base goes because the IP is now being shared. And I think that is a really difficult emotional journey for leaders to go through. You've got to be incredibly brave if you're gonna go and give up your kind of barriers to your position, the IP that you've got and the network and the control that you've created. But that's, you know, but that's only if you think you're handing everything over that you worked so hard for and what you worked so hard to accomplish. Um, there has to be someone driving the train. I mean, there has to be one person. We can't all be, you know, in the cockpit or, or whatever, handling the control. So 
when we're talking about uh, flattening the hierarchy, it's not saying that we are going to do away with certain people's roles and, their, and the responsibilities that those roles come with. But it's how can we integrate all of this so that the structures are not siloized and monolithic. And that term in South Africa, we've seen the, the negative consequences of living and working in silos. We see cost overruns. We see um, the duplication of work. It's all of these negative things. Um, as a leader, not, not even diluting that control, and, and maybe it's the wrong frame in which to, to ask this question, but it's about inclusivity. How inclusive are you in your decision making? You are going to make the final decision. Fine. How inclusive are you? Um, how inclusive are you? Um, you know, can your ego withstand, uh, or you know, can your position withstand criticism of a route and a and a policy or strategic direction that you made for the company? If you're open to all of those things, you can still have a strong sense of who you are, and you can still be the leader of the organization. It just means that you've allowed yourself to be open to that symphony of criticism, which can only, in the end benefit your organization and your own decision-making. A great question that's come here from, uh, from Duke. What are your views on shadow boards? I like this question and their potential to drive the purpose agenda or, or I guess any other agenda within the organization, but specifically purpose agendas. Yeah, Duke, uh, and uh, we've seen it, um, you know, we, we've, we've seen it in this economy and we, you know, we look at um, sort of gloved or shadowed interests behind the scene, may not always be boards, but it could be interest groups that have influence on decisions uh, that are made. It could be, um, you know, financiers that want to overly um, direct how, you know, companies run, especially in our context. When we, when we look at what's been happening, and that's why we're talking about the way the PIC Amendment Act is now unfolded and, and what it means. Of course, that one caveat about a government employee being chair of the board is a bone of contention. But that's why we're talking about this, because transparency is important to not sort of surreptitiously hollowing out an organization or defocusing it from, from where it needs to be. So, so that is what I see as, as really um, you know, toxic and has the potential to derail what you term there as a purpose-led agenda for an organization. You see uh, Dilly's comment there, management by wandering around. Is that a term that uh, you've constructed? But Where's that, okay. Tommy? What management is it? by great insights and suggestions based on your observations. But I love that term, management by wandering around. It's an MBWA. And yes. I love that, really. I think that's fantastic. I might just take that and I will, I will give you all the, <laughs> all the credit, I promise. There is a benefit to that. I mean, if you think about how cartography happened, uh, yeah, sure, they had the ability, you know, to map, the, uh, to, to kind of um, sail the seas, but we didn't have, the only reason we know the world as it is today is because the early cartographers and explorers were there, were there and they did it by wandering around. So I'm charting, you know, a new sort of <laughs> geographical course for myself. And, and, and I think um, that, as I say, you know, some things are, have become too overly complicated. Life and business, the running of a business can be much simpler than we make it out to be. Awesome. Cara, welcome back. Have you got a question? No, nope, I think we're just probably running short on time. So I thought maybe we could we could wrap it up. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that this last hour has been pure oxygenation for all of us. <laughs> um, I am I'm very I'm, I'm deeply Deeply grateful, Iman, for your time and your incredible insights that you've brought. I think there's been so many questions and comments that from everybody on the group chat to so seeing how meaningful it has been to everybody. And Colin, thank you so much for facilitating the session. Um, as always, I mean, time always just goes way, way too quickly, but laser focus and fun, I think, were some of the things that I took from this as well, especially in this time. It's been a challenging time for all of us. And managing teams and remembering to keep that front of mind. It's always a good reminder as well. So thank you so much. Um, I just want to give a shout out to, to some of our guests that joined us today from uh, St. Cobain, Absa, Buffalo Cole, just to name a few. Um, your time is invaluable to us, so thank you. Um, next week, we're speaking to businessman Colin Coleman about purposeful leadership from a global perspective. So make sure that you sign up for that. And Obviously, the success of these series would not be possible without everybody's participation, which I think was absolutely outstanding today. So on that note, I'm going to say goodbye all and to stay safe. And if everyone, yeah, 
you mind if you want to just say goodbye? And Colin, that would be great. Yeah, just thank you for this time. Thank you for all the interaction. And I just really appreciate all of you. Please be safe out there. Take care. <laughs>